Thank you for joining us today. This is the fifth webinar in Brooks's RTI and Early Childhood webinar series. We're glad you're watching. My name is Christina Davis and I am the Marketing Manager for Early Childhood Books at Brooks Publishing. In today's webinar, you will learn how to address the learning and development of young dual language learners with the RTI-based framework called Recognition and Response for Dual Language Learners. Dr. Dory LaFourette is with us today to present the webinar. As an investigator at the FPG Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Dr. LaFourette's research focuses on school readiness, mental health, family functioning during early childhood, with an emphasis on low income and ethnic or language minority populations. Her work aims to make educational and behavioral interventions and services more accessible to children and families. She currently works on projects that seek to build research capacity in the study of dual language learners ages birth to five, with recent efforts that include adapting recognition and response for use with Spanish-speaking preschoolers. I'll now turn it over to Dr. LaFourette so you can learn how adapting components of recognition and response improves instruction for dual language learners. You're welcome to begin your presentation, Dr. LaFourette. Hello, everybody. Can, can everybody hear me okay, I hope? Um, thank you, Christina, for that introduction. We're going to go ahead and move forward with the objectives, um, one of which uh, Christina had already mentioned, which is to introduce how to address learning and development of young dual language learners with the recognition and response for dual language learner model, which involves adapting the assessment and instruction components of the RTI-based approach. Um, this information is what is covered in that um, handbook of RTI and child and early childhood book um, in the chapter 23 recognition response for dual language learners which is um, written by myself as well as Dr. Ellen Peisner Feinberg and Dr. Virginia Bicey who are the editors of the handbook. So a lot of what I'll be covering today relates to the information that's in that chapter in terms of what this model is. And then the second objective relates to some new information that I'll be sharing with you guys that's really not presented in that chapter, and that is some results from the study that we've done on the R&R DLL model, which um, will help us with our second ob objective to understand how the R&R DLL model has the potential to improve instruction for dual language learners. So moving us forward, I would like to get a sense of who is in the audience. I know that um, there are lots of different groups of folks who work with dual language learners. Um, you may be someone who is a teacher, education coordinator, a PD provider, maybe you're in a learning specialist or allied health group, like a um, teacher of English as a second language, a, a speech language pathologist, or a school psychologist, maybe you're a researcher, or maybe none of these categories um, fit you. So I believe Christina is going to be launching a poll yep. for folks to um, choose which um, category best describes them, them, and we'll wait for those results to come up before going ahead. And if you fall into that other category, please feel free to type in um, your answer into the question box, and I will be happy to share those. So the majority of... Um, of our attendees um, are teachers or education coordinators at 44 percent and then you know about 15, 17 percent um, professional development providers. So lots of people in the other category, let's see, inclusion specialist, Part B coordinator, school readiness program, evaluator. So that is who is listening in today. Great. Well, thank you all for um, responding with the poll. It's, it's good to know um, in what capacity folks are working with dual language learners. And it sounds like a good chunk of you guys are um, really in that on the ground level, having those um, very direct interactions with um, the young kids who are DLLs. Um, so let's talk about who, um, who are DLLs. So the definition that we are using um, in our chapter is we define dual language learners as children who are learning a second language, which for all our purposes really is English, while continuing to acquire their first or home language. Um, so these are the children that we are, are talking about. We're not talking about children who necessarily come from primarily English-speaking backgrounds, and then maybe they go to like a 
uh, Spanish immersion or French immersion or Chinese immersion um, type of a setting to get more experience with that language. We're really talking about um, children who are traditionally thought of as dual language learners as um, either not having English as a home language at all or simultaneously learning English and another home language um, during their early years. We know that there are lots of different languages that are represented among dual language learners. And I'd like to hear from you guys um, which of these language groups are represented or the DLLs that you work with in your community. Um, these are just a very, very small sampling of some of the common languages that we know are um, represented in early care and education pro programs. Um, I'd like for you to vote on um, which of these languages are represented in your community. And you start more than one. That's um, very common, as we, we also know. So I'll wait a moment for that. And again, if you are clicking on the other option, if you could just type in what language that is. Majority, I'm sure you guessed, was Spanish. And it looks like it's primarily all Spanish and then a couple of others, but I'm not seeing any um, responses to the other selection, so it's unknown. <laughs> OK, well, um, I think your responses definitely reflect um, what we know about the majority of dual language learners um, in the United States, with the, the high majority of them being from Spanish language backgrounds. But we know from other research that um, there are so, so many, well over 100 languages represented in our early care and education programs currently, with some programs experiencing many languages represented within a given classroom or district or what have you. Um, so what this really illustrates for us is that dual language learners are quite a diverse group, which um, poses a lot of you unique opportunities for us in terms of learning how to best support them, but also um, present some challenges in, in learning how to um, support them as well. Um, so why don't we go ahead and um, move forward with going over with um, getting into what this model is, or an RDLL. To do that, I'd like to give a brief um, introduction of the core recognition and response model. Um, just briefly going over the key components to orient folks who may not be familiar with this program of research, which was developed by Dr. Spicey and Peisner Feinberg. Um, so to go over these key, key components, we have, of course, the recognition piece and a response piece. The recognition piece relates to the formative assessment aspect of RTI. This involves universal screening for all children, as well as progress monitoring for some children. The response component relates to the instructional piece of RTI and is defined as core instruction for all children and targeted interventions for some children. This model is also then supported by ongoing professional development and other supports for helping teachers to implement the model in their classrooms and use the data from formative assessments to make decisions about how to proceed with instruction. What this looks like visually when we think about an RTI approach is we see our familiar triangle that um, those of us who are acquainted with RTI um, see often that illustrates the three tiers representing um, both the assessment side and the instruction side. So um, very briefly, we have our tier one, which applies to all children and consists of the formative assessment. And on the instruction side, um, has research-based core curriculum and intentional teaching. Then in tier two, which is for some children, um, those children will receive, of course, formative assessment as well as um, additional instructional supports, will, which will include explicit small group interventions and embedded learning activities. And then tier three um, relates to the supports for a few children. Again, we have our formative assessment piece. And on the instruction side, we have individualized scaffolding strategies. And in terms of going from Tier 1 to, until Tier 3, we have that interaction between formative assessment and instruction where um, the results from formative assessment determine which children 
receive those additional supports at Tiers 2 and 3. We also see our triangle is surrounded by the collaborative problem-solving approach that I referred to earlier, um, in which teachers um, in interact um, around the three tiers in order to um, identify which children need additional supports and how to use their data to um, both implement those supports and also um, gauge their effectiveness. There have been a couple of studies that have been done on the r, &R model, um, really focused on language and literacy development. The first study was conducted in Maryland and Florida, and the second one in North Carolina. Both studies found positive effects of the r, &R intervention. Um, and one thing that we'd like to point out is that both of these studies included some children who were dual language learners. But these two initial studies of r, &R really were not designed to address the unique assessment and instructional needs of dual language learners. So we ask ourselves then, how do we take the r, &R model to the next step in order to support this group of children? Well, in order to do that, we really want to think about what do we know from research on young dual language learners. Um, Primarily, we can identify some needs based on what the research tells us. One of those needs is that um, we really need to identify valid methods for determining children's language status and measuring their skill development in L1, their home or first language, as well as L2, um, English. We also know that we need to um, develop and identify effective educational interventions for dual language learners that will support their development in L1 and L2 and that are also matched to their unique learning characteristics and goals. A final thing we need to think about from um, past research on dual language learners and really what we know about working with this population in early care and education settings is that these children really are in a variety of contexts and settings um, in which um, teachers and other early care and education staff um, interact with them. So when we think about these, this variety, we think about different types of settings such as um, public school settings, such as private child care, um, child, uh, child care, home, um, child care um, settings that are based in the home. So lots of different types of settings in which um, dual language learners are having these early education experiences. Another thing that's important to point out in terms of context is um, the extent to which the children are exposed to different languages, whether it's um, their um, L1 or whether it's English. Um, that can really run the game as well. So all of those things need to be considered when we're thinking about the educational experiences that young DLLs have. So I'd like to say a few words about the rationale for developing the r, &R DLL model. Well, based on the research literature, we have um, discovered that there is very little evidence for the efficacy of any particular educational program or intervention for dual language learners in pre-K. And what that means is that there have been um, lots of different things have, that have been tried and, and, and tested and reported on in the literature, and there's no overwhelming body of evidence that supports one approach versus the other. So that really, um, that really hinders our, our being able to know, OK, this is the one to use or not that one to use or, or things of that nature. Um, from our perspective, we thought that the, the core r, r model offered a useful framework for linking assessment to instruction, but it didn't include accommodations for DLLs. We thought it was a useful framework for DLLs for um, a few key reasons based on um, recommendations in the research literature for um, DLLs, particularly in the K-12 through setting, um, but really um, recommendations that are consistent with an RTI approach. So some of these recommendations include things like 
when you work with dual language learners, it's important to use formative assessments. Um, it's important to use small group lessons. It's important to use explicit and differentiated instruction. So we really saw a parallel between these recommendations in general for dual language learners and the RTI framework. So we really thought, OK, well, how can we adapt our model in order to um, best serve the needs of young dual language learners? We really kind of see a good match here. Um, so that leads to the third point is then um, our rationale also included making sure our formative assessment and tiered instruction components of that core R&R model um, had accommodations that accounted for children's skills in both L1 and L2. So a few different things were going on here in our thoughts in terms of moving forward with our adaptations. What I'd like to do now is get more specific into what those adaptations are now. So this next section of the presentation is going to involve really getting into a description of the R&R DLL model. And I'll be sharing with you these adaptations and showing you some videos of what this looks like in practice. Um, so now that you have a good sense of what the core R&R uh, model looks like, how do we adapt it? Well, on the assessment side, formative assessment side, what we added to the model was using a parallel assessment procedure. And this involved conducting the formative assessments in English as well as in Spanish. Um, so when we did this, we really did this on um, two different um, days. So one day would be in English, and one day would be in Spanish. And, and I'll show you. Uh, I'll say more about that in just a moment. Um, I do describe this more in the chapter in terms of the, the rationale for this. The reason why we really want to engage in parallel assessment is it allows us um, a few different advantages. It really helps us get a good sense of the total fund of knowledge that these children have in the two languages. Um, by doing our formative assessment in two languages, it also helps us get a sense of the local norms in the classroom. Um, think about who are the children's peers. Are they being compared to um, the peers who might be more similar to them, or are they being um, compared to more national standard, which is um, more that standard approach of standardized assessment? Another um, plus we saw from doing parallel assessments um, for our purposes is that it really seemed like this method could reduce the potential for over-identifying children for special services. And by doing the parallel assessment at multiple time points, we felt would help us really gauge the children's responsiveness to the interventions, um, both at Tier 1 as well as when they um, were engaging in those um, additional supports, such as at Tier 2. The second area of adaptation um, is, of course, on the instructional side. And that relates to having specific instructional supports to promote children's development in L1 and L2. And our thinking on this is really formed by the existing literature on what we know about young dual language learners' development in language and literacy. And I'll say more about that in a little while. Let's talk about how we implemented this formative assessment piece within the r, &R DLL model. What this entailed was that teachers gathered formative assessment data on all the children in their classroom. The measure that we used was the C PALS Plus. And that looks at skills such as letter naming, vocabulary, and phonological awareness. We, um, as I was mentioning, had the teachers conduct the assessments in English and Spanish in separate sessions. And we also had an assessment schedule of three time points, including fall, winter, and spring. What I'd like to do now is show you an example. This example is uh, in um, English. One second. If you don't know, some are uppercase and some are lowercase. Let's see how many you can name. Are you ready? My 
My dog runs fast. My dog runs fast. My dog runs fast. Let's go. Let's go. Mother, read to me. Mother, read to me. Mother, read to me. Oh my god, I have an extra one, the big long one. Are you ready for this? Challenging one? I swim every morning for fun. I swim every morning for fun. Okay, move them back. Let's go to the next big one, the big sentence. My sister goes to the store. My sister goes to the store. Mm -hmm. Very good. Ball. Ball. Wagon. Wagon. Hat. Hat. Water. Water. Candy. Candy. Banana. Banana. Okay, hope folks were able to hear that okay. If you couldn't hear, what we were really showing was some different subtests of the CPALS Plus um, administered in English. And you could see the interaction between the teacher and the child. Um, it's pretty fast paced, but um, it is also designed to be short and easy to administer on the teacher's end. The way we handle this in uh, a parallel assessment um, situation is that example you just saw was very typical of um, how, um, how an assessment would go in English. And then perhaps on a couple days later, the teacher would then do the same assessment but do it in Spanish. So that was the arrangement for the formative assessment piece using parallel assessments. And now what I'd like to do is um, tell you about how we implemented the instructional piece within the r, &R DLL model. So the first thing to point out is that the classrooms continue to use their core curriculum in language and literacy. At Tier 1, what we added was having um, the teachers engage in dialogic reading um, using some instructional support strategies that we developed um, for dual language learners. And these were, again, um, instructional support pieces that were for all children because they were delivered at um, Tier 1. In terms of dialogic reading, um, this was something that we chose in particular um, given its promise to improve the language skills of dual language learners. Um, time doesn't allow us to go into detail about what dialogic reading is if you're not familiar with it. I will just briefly say that um, it is an evidence-based strategy that really uses um, dialogue between adults and children with teachers giving um, some structured prompts during a storybook interaction. You can read more about dialogic reading on the What Works Clearinghouse website. The second piece, the DLL instructional support strategies, I will be saying more about that in the second slide. Before I get to that, I do want to also mention the um, changes we made at Tier 2 in terms of implementation. And that is that our small group lessons were bilingual. Um, again, these are the, since they're tier two, these are the small group lessons that are with the target children, children who were identified as needing additional support based on their formative assessment results in English and in Spanish. Just a few words about how we define our tier two small group lessons. These are 15 to 20 minute lessons, um, which is a developmentally appropriate length. They involve using an evidence-based curriculum in this case, we use the OWL curriculum. Um, we also, in um, developing our bilingual small group lessons, really made a point to um, think very thoughtfully about strategic use of English and Spanish in doing those lessons across um, different skill areas that were the focus, areas like vocabulary, phonological awareness, and letter naming. And we really made decisions about when to use which language or both languages for those different skill areas based on what we found in the research as well as what was feasible in the implementation. 
Okay, so um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the instructional support strategies in the model. These are described in the um, a nice table in the chapter, which I won't go over um, in detail, but the, the uh, table is nice because it also shows some nice examples um, using language that you might hear in a classroom in terms of using these strategies. But we have two core strategies here. Um, one is called bridging, and the other is visual and contextual cueing. The bridging strategies are very much um, dual language learner focused in that they involve integrating um, integrating strategies that involve English as well as the home language. Um, so here we have two types of um, bridging strategies. One is um, dual language instruction. And this um, involves uh, using and encouraging the use of both English and the home language for selected instruction. There are several different ways that teachers can do this. One is through introducing or defining words and concepts. Um, another way is through teaching letter names and sounds. And the third way is acknowledging and encouraging children's responses in both languages. Um, so those are um, skills that, like I was saying, involve um, using both languages for strategic instructional purposes. The second category, the visual and contextual, oh, excuse me, I forgot about the um, dual, meta linguistic strategies. The meta linguistic strategies um, we define as ways to describe uh, the similarities and differences between English and the home language. Um, the way that teachers can do this is through pointing out words that are cognates um, in English and Spanish, um, noting the similarities and differences in how those words are spelled, their pronunciation, and their meaning. And then also, um, teachers can use these metalinguistic strategies um, regarding uh, phonological similarities and differences between the two languages, like what are the phonemes at the beginning of the words? What about the ending words? Um, what are some sounds that are present in one language but not in another? Things of that nature. So all those together encompass um, the two different types of bridging strategies. That is the dual language instruction as well as the meta linguistic strategies. Then the second core approach um, is the visual and contextual cueing. And these are strategies that really are best practice in early childhood education. Um, so they're not specific to dual language learners, but they're thought to be especially helpful for this population. Um, so when we're talking about visual cues, um, this can involve lots of different types of approaches, such as pointing, gestures, using, using um, pictures, um, picture cues, props, your facial expressions, all those sorts of things. The contextual cues um, involve using children's contextual knowledge to help them understand new words and concepts. So drawing on you know, what you know about them in their home life or referring to um, different contextual cues based on material covered in the classroom, such as, you know, that day or in a, a previous um, activity, such as a field trip or, or something like that. So um, these are strategies that do not rely on integrating um, L1 and L2. And I should also say something that we get asked sometimes is, you know, are these two types of um, approaches, the bridging and the visual and contextual cueing, are they separate or can you put them together? Of course you can put them together, and in fact they're probably even more powerful when you put them together, um, but we sort of just describe them as, as two pieces, but they certainly, certainly can be integrated. Okay, so um, let's look at a small group lesson here. What is this? Newspaper. Newspaper. If I break newspaper, into two different parts. I get news and paper. I, if I take away news from paper, what is left? Paper. 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 Good job. What's this? Flashlight. Flashlight. Very good, Sean. If I take flash away from flashlight, what word is left? Light. Light. Good job. This is a? Butterfly. Butterfly. If I take butter away from butterfly, what word am I left with? 
Right. Good. Good job, Sean. What is this? Playground. Playground. Good, Alejandro. Playground. If I take the word play away from playground, what word am I left with? Play. If I take play away from playground, I'm left with the word ground. Say ground. Ground. Good. Okay. ¿Qué es esto? Girasol. Si elimino la palabra giro de girasol, me quedo con qué palabra? Giro. Me quedo con sol. ¿Qué es esto? Paraguas. Si elimino la palabra para de paraguas, me quedo que, con qué palabra? Agua. Agua. Muy bien, Kela. Now we're ready for letter time. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Today we're learning this letter. Uh huh. What is this a picture of? An astronaut. An astronaut. This is what? The capital letter A. Very good. The capital letter A has straight lines in it. Can we make the capital letter A with our finger? Let's write it in the air. Up, then down, then across. Very, very good. What letter is this? The A. The. The, it's the letter A. The lowercase letter A. Can we write the lowercase letter A with our finger in the air? It has a straight line and a curved line, right? Let's make the curved line. Circle. And then straight line. Let me see you do it, Ashley. Good. Very, very good. First, we'll do the this and then this. Mm -hmm. Whose name? Do you, do you know whose name starts with these letters? Mm -hmm. We have two children in our group. Ashley Z and Alejandro. Ashley Z, Ashley, and Alejandro. So let's look at our names. This is Sean's name. name. This is Kayla's name, Alejandro's name, and Ashley's name. Look at your name. Whose name starts with the capital letter A? Who, whose name has a capital letter A in it? Alejandro and Ashley. Good. Does anybody have a lowercase letter A in their name? Sean has a lowercase letter A. Very good. And Kayla, you also have a lowercase letter A. Do you have a lowercase letter A? Good. So you have a capital letter A in your name and a lowercase letter A. I have single dose. Good job. Okay. Um, let me give a little recap on that. Um, so I just, I just love watching that video. I really enjoy watching that teacher with those kids. Um, I hope some of the things that you noticed are um, there were different times when the teacher was using English and Spanish. So the way that this clip unfolded is you saw um, the teacher do some of those vocabulary and phonological awareness tasks first in English, and she went through that entire sequence in English, and then she did it again in Spanish. Um, then what she did toward the end is she had some letter naming activities in which she used English only. And that's a really good example of what I was referring to earlier and how our team made some very um, strategic decisions about when the um, teacher was going to use the different languages and for what skill area. And these decisions were really, as I was saying, based on what is known in the literature about children's development in English and Spanish in particular. And this rationale is explained in a lot more detail in the chapter in the book. I don't have time to go through it right now, but you can read a little bit more about um, how we made those decisions in the chapter. OK, um, so that covers what um, we have in terms of the adaptations for the r and DLL model. What I'd like to show you now is some of the research that has come out of examining this model um, to help us think about the um, potential for improving children's skill areas when they um, use this model in the classroom. Um, so this information comes from um, a study that we did um, in Miami. And I'll say more about that sample in just a moment. But the questions that we looked at is we wanted to know whether the children um, make greater gains in language and literacy 
competency skills in our intervention classrooms, the ones that use the r and model, compared to some control classrooms that did not use the model at all. And then we really also wanted to know, are the gains the greatest for target children in the intervention classroom? So this is the group um, of children who, in those intervention classrooms, participated in those small group lessons, just like the ones that you, um, you saw in the clip. OK. So who did we work with in this study? We um, did a randomized control um, design with assignment at classroom level. So we had 16 classrooms that implemented the intervention and eight that were considered the um, control classrooms. In all, we worked with 318 Spanish-speaking dual language learner children who were four years old. And we worked with um, a couple of different types of pre-K sites in Miami-Dade County, Florida. Some were community-based sites, and others were um, public school pre-K sites. OK. I told you earlier about the formative assessment tool that we use, that CPALS Plus. Um, the, this slide here shows the measures that we use to evaluate the effectiveness of the intervention. So for our child outcomes, um, we looked at vocabulary with two different measures, um, the receptive one-word picture vocabulary test and the expressive one-word picture vocabulary test. Um, and then we also um, looked at some letter word identification skills using um, the Woodcock-Johnson test of achievement and as, as well the um, Spanish version, the Barria. And we also looked at some phonological awareness skills in um, the rhyming subtest of those uh, two batteries. And similar to how we have our formative assessment approach, we also took a parallel assessment approach with these um, outcome measures, conducting them both in English and in Spanish. Um, we also gathered some um, data doing classroom observations. Um, using um, the ELCO, the, um, which looks at language and literacy environment in the classroom. Um, we looked at um, how teachers were doing in um, using those dialogic reading strategies and those um, DLL strategies that I mentioned earlier, the dual language instruction, the metalinguistic awareness strategies, and the visual and contextual cueing. And then we also gathered some information um, from families and teachers just sort of about background characteristics and things like that. OK, so how do we decide who participates in the small group lessons at Tier 2? For this, we really look at our formative assessment data in both languages, thinking about you know, language profiles, per se. So we can think about this very generically in terms of four different categories. Children who are low, low skills on both um, English and Spanish, children who are high on both skills, English and Spanish, and children who have some sort of combination of low and high, which is more, more indicative of um, uneven development in terms of uh, both of those languages. Uh, from this list, though, what we really want to point out is that our target children, the children who um, we think are in greatest need of additional supports, are the children in that first group, low English and low Spanish. So these were primarily the children who participated in the small group lessons. And I'd like to show you some um, graphs now for the for that group of children. So let's move on. And I'd like to show you um, some differences here between um, children who participated in those small group lessons compared to children in the control classrooms who would have been eligible to participate in those small group lessons had their classroom been participating, or excuse me, implementing the r and model. This first. Um, chart here looks at letter naming. So we can see that um, for letter naming in English, that um, our darker line, the one with the star next to it, those are the children in the target group for the intervention classroom, whereas the other line is the children in the control classrooms who would have been eligible. They were the low, low, so to speak, in the control classroom. And we can see. Um, a greater rate of growth here for the children in the target group in those intervention classrooms. Um, and we also have a nice effect size here, if there's any researchers in the audience here, of that, that 0.36. Next thing I'd like to show you is um, some results for phonological awareness. 
here we have some nice results for um, children's skills in English, that's on the left, and then in Spanish. So we also see a nice gap between those two groups indicating that greater rate of growth for those intervention target children compared to those um, in the control group. Um, the other thing that we um, see here is um, the, um, the, the growth in the, the um, Spanish skills in particular because the children are being exposed to the skills in both English and Spanish during the small group lessons. And the last one I'd like to show you is the expressive vocabulary um, difference. This is in English. And, and even though these two lines look very close together toward that top of the, the chart there, there, that is a statistically significant difference with the intervention children um, outperforming um, the children in the control group having that greater rate of growth. So in summary, um, we find some nice effects of the intervention um, for ch children's skills in English as well as their skills in Spanish. Um, our effects for English, we find some differences in expressive vocabulary for um, our target children as well as for um, when we just look at the classroom level as a whole, not even the children who participated in the um, small group lessons, that's what that all refers to. So all refers to at the classroom level, and then target refers to those children who participated specifically in those small groups. Um, so in addition to the effects for um, expressive vocabulary in English, we see a similar pattern for phonological awareness. And then um, the target children also making a greater rate of growth for the letter naming, which is one of those graphs that I had showed you. For Spanish, we see um, growth in um, phonological awareness um, co in comparing at the classroom level as well as for the target children, and then growth on the Spanish letters when we're looking at the classroom level. Um, we see consistency here across both languages in the areas of phonological awareness in particular. Um, what, the, what these findings also illustrate is that um, exposure to Spanish in the classroom does not necessarily have to come at the expense of children's progress in English, which is something that um, is talked about in various circles in terms of well, what will happen if we you know, introduce Spanish um, into the classroom or whatever the child's home language may be. OK, next steps. Um, for our team, anyhow, are we have um, you know, been asking ourselves, so what are, what are some questions that still need to be addressed related to implementing tiered instructional models for dual language learners? This is something that we're thinking about on our end. We also want to be thinking about how transportable is this knowledge, for, this model for serving dual language. Language learners in other classrooms. Um, what if the, you know we were working in a much larger school district? What kind of resources would that entail? Things of that nature. Um, so those are some things that our team is thinking about and moving forward with um, this work. And what I'll do now is um, I will um, wrap up this section of the presentation. And I know we have um, an offer to show you, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the next slide and let Christina. Um, talk about this. Yes, thank you. Very informative presentation. Um, and actually, when you were doing your um, study, sharing your study findings, we did receive some questions, so we're going to circle back to those. Um, but if anybody has questions that they come up with now while I'm going over this quick discount, feel free to type them in the box and I will get to them. So um, in the meantime, just want to let you know that we are extending a discount on a handbook um, that you know, the webinar series stems from. So if you're interested, you can get a 20% off code or discount using the code RTIEC20, and it's good till uh, next June. So if we want to go ahead and um, just quickly circle back to the study finding. So um, one of our um, participants wants to know if you can explain the rationale for using two types of assessment for the pre and post test and how long uh, was your intervention. OK, let me write down both pieces of the question. Explain rationale for assessment, different assessments at pre and post. Mm -hmm. Was that the question? That was. OK. 
Okay, um, so why don't I go back to um, one of those slides. Um, oops, I went in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, okay, so you can see here on this phonological awareness slide, there, this is the same measure. So um, you can see the fall English phonological awareness. I'm looking at the graph on the left in the spring. This is both with the Seep House Plus. So there was no difference between what we did in the fall versus what we did in the spring. So I'm, I'm not sure where the confusion is. If that person still has a follow-up question, um, I'm happy to take it. But for all the, the, the pre-post, we didn't switch what the measure was from one time point to the next. The difference you may be thinking of is that for the formative assessment, which was done the three times a year, which has mostly these results I'm showing you here, that was always with the CPALS Plus. This slide here, this expressive vocabulary with the EOW, this was also done at fall and spring. The difference is that this was not a formative assessment tool. This was an outcome tool to gauge the effectiveness of the study. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a second question on that. Correct? Oh, how long was um, your intervention? OK. so. Um, the length of the intervention, it was a year-long intervention, but had different windows of um, implementing different pieces. Um, the length of time for the small group lessons were done um, in about an eight-week window twice a year. So in the fall, we had an intervention window for the small group lessons, and then again in the spring, another eight-week window. And during each of these eight-week windows, the teachers delivered um, approximately 30 um, of the small group lessons, so 30 in fall and 30 in spring. And the goal was more or less to do those lessons every day with that small group of children. Of course, you know, there might be a day or so where they didn't do a small group lesson because it was you know, a field trip or a picture day or that kind of thing. But in general, those were the, the levels of, of intensity for those small group lessons. Um, the other interventions um, at Tier 1 in particular were not necessarily linked to um, the small group lesson window. So those could have also been occurring um, you know, outside of those uh, times when the small group lessons were going on, in between the eight-week windows, I should say. And how was uh, the sampling population chosen? OK, so um, we did have a partner in Miami, and um, one of the things that for this initial study that was a requirement was that we um, needed to be able to work with teachers who were bilingual in English and Spanish. Um, so that was one of the things that we focused on in working with our partner to identify um, candidates to participate in the study. The other thing we looked at is we needed um, a strong representation of children within a classroom who um, could participate in the study as well. I mean, if there were only maybe two children in the, the classroom who are dual language learners, that really wouldn't have worked well for doing a study of this sort. So based on that pool of um, potential classrooms for us to work with, both in um, public pre-K and um, community-based um, settings through working with our partner, um, through, through that group of folks, then we did random assignment to whether they received the intervention or um, remained as a control group. And I have, we have a question about um, if teachers are not bilingual, can you still do the assessment with the children? What a great question. That is something that I get a questions about um, a lot. And I think it really depends on um, it depends on a few things. It depends on the teacher's comfort level. And the, the real key here is making sure that the teacher would have enough skills in that home language to be able to do, the, um, to do essentially a valid assessment. So if the teacher had enough um, background in the language or familiarity with, with the children to be able to um, determine whether responses were correct or incorrect or, or you know, things like that, then you would have a, a stronger case for being able to do that. But if, some, if a teacher wasn't comfortable um, or she didn't know enough of the language to be able to judge whether a child's response was correct or incorrect, then you start to compromise the validity of the test. 
Thank you. And let's see, a couple more about, um, I hope you're okay with this question session right now. Yeah, um, um, a question about the lead teacher being pulled away from the whole class for that small group instruction. So the um, attendee wanted you to discuss, um, you know, how, how best to do that and how to not take up too much time from the lead teacher, you know, being pulled away from the whole class in order to give direct assessment in two languages. Great. Um, okay, so that, that reminds me there was um, something I wanted to point out when I showed the video of the small group lesson. And you probably noticed that there was nobody in the classroom. That was for filming purposes only. <laughs> when teachers are really doing this, it is in a very vibrant and active um, classroom with lots of things going on. It's loud. I hear you know, someone, some of our folks who are teachers that you know, you know how active and busy the classroom environment can be. What we recommend is that teachers um, deliver the small group lessons in that, you know, in the classroom environment, not away from the classroom where, um, you know, th we want this to be viewed as part of classroom time. So we often recommend that teachers um, do the small group lessons during um, center time, for instance, um, since they are about 15 to 20 minutes, um, it is something that usually can be folded in within center time. Um, it is something that often requires a lot of coordination and, and planning with um, teacher assistants and um, paraprofessionals if there are any in the classroom. Um, it also involves um, teachers using um, some nice behavior management skills and setting up structure for the children who are not participating in the small group. We've had teachers give lots of creative ideas on how to um, you know, have children um, respect the boundaries of that space and that activity and, and things like that. And same thing goes for the assessment. The assessments are very short. They're less than 10 minutes per child. Um, and so, you know, recommending when are good times to do that. Well, it depends on the child. It can be, um, you know, again, during center time. It can also be during, um, like, drop-off time. If you have a child who, you know, comes and that's a child who you need to assess and there aren't very many children there yet and you can complete your assessment in those 10 minutes, wonderful. If you have a non-napper, that's another um, potential opportunity. So, I mean, it does take some um, creativity. And, and in an early childhood classroom, you, you are very unlikely to have an opportunity where it's just you know complete silence and you have you know the calm to just be able to devote to that one thing. So it does require some planning and negotiation with other folks on that teaching team. And would you recommend a more diligent use of a well-regarded authentic assessment or, um, or as opposed to adding on multiple supplemental tools? So just using one versus, um, yeah. For which purpose? For what, what would be the purpose of this particular assessment in the question? Um, it was uh, related to, um, you know, overburdening the staff and um, choosing one versus multiple tools to use in the assessment. Okay, so what I, um, what I should say, and I don't know if this was clear from the presentation, is that the formative assessment is the only thing that is gathered by the teachers. Those other measures that I mentioned, um, those outcome measures for the, you know, receptive and expressive vocabulary, the letter word identification, the rhyming, all of those were gathered by the research team as part of evaluating the effectiveness of the of the intervention. So in terms of the teachers, um, those three tests on the CPALS Plus, the letter naming, vocabulary, and, and phonological awareness, those combined take less than 10 minutes. So I don't know if that answers that person's question. Okay, and I saw that you had some um, slides, so we can proceed with those as we have no more questions at the moment. Okay, well, I do just have a couple other questions. Um, that people often ask me. Um, one is um, sometimes I get a question of whether it's better to do the entire small group instruction in both languages. What I showed you really just had um, an example of a very selected um, instruction. And this is described a little bit more in um, the chapter, but since we're short on time, I'll just um, quickly say that um, these choices were made based on where we thought we could make the most impact, so where would it be the most beneficial to do the skills in both languages, and then, quite frankly, how much time do you have 
to do the small group lesson. We don't want it to take more than 15 to 20 minutes. And there were some activities that were like shared storybook reading. Um, and you can't effectively read a whole book in Spanish and a whole book in English, depending on what the book is in the 20 minute window. Um, so that's described more in the chapter. Um, Someone already asked a little bit about how to work with languages other than Spanish. And then, um, oh, excuse me, they asked about the third question about children, uh, teachers who do not speak the child's home language. To both of these latter questions, um, both of these have to consider what resources do you have available? What resources do you have available to do valid assessments? Um, and then what are the skills of the teaching staff? There are some, some aspects of this model that can be done um, independent of speaking both languages, as you saw in the instructional support strategies, um, some that really do pull on both. So in order to fully answer um, these questions, they really would have to um, take a look at what existing resources um, and figure out the match between existing resources and the community needs as a starting place in order to figure out what would be feasible. OK, if folks want to read more, um, there's the information here for the chapter. I've also included another reference here for this model that is um, an article in the Young Exceptional Children Monograph series. This latter article also um, gives some um, illustration in the classroom as well in terms of implementation. So um, both of these are um, available for your reading if you want to read more. Great. So if you, um, doesn't look like we have any more questions. I don't know if you have any last words, Dr. LaFourette. Um, no, I just want to thank folks for um, tuning in today. And um, you know, I, I hope this um, information is helpful to you in working with the children in your community. Yes, so on behalf of Dr. LaFourette and all of us at Brooks, I want to thank you for joining us. And this is the last webinar in our fall webinar series, but we will continue in the spring with several, several more uh, webinars on selected topics, and those are all free. So um, we hope that to see you on one of the webinars in the spring.